Hey everyone, Charlie here from the Atomic Age. I'm a nuclear engineer who likes to take a look at how nuclear physics and nuclear engineering are portrayed in movies and TV shows and try and give you guys some context, try and elaborate on things further that may have been glossed over or that were not explained at all in the first place. So today we're looking at episode nine from season one of the hit sci-fi show, The Expanse. Our heroes, James Holden, and Joe Miller on Eros, and the henchmen of Jules-Pierre Mao are starting an experiment on Eros with the proto-molecule, and uh, Holden and Miller happen to run into some crazy radiation, so we're going to take a look at that today and see how the show does in its depiction of radiation. Now, I love this show. It really has a very grounded feel of how human technology could look in a few hundred years, and if you haven't seen it, it really is a great show. There will be spoilers here, of course. Uh, every TV show these days has spoilers, but uh, let's jump right into it. Iodine supplement. Protect the radiation. Mandatory. There's a here. They're given a... Well, they say it's an iodine supplement. I don't think it is. Uh, so if there were to be a nuclear reactor explosion, one of the potentially very dangerous isotopes released... Uh, or it could be a nuclear bomb explosion too. And one of the products that you get is iodine-131. This is a particularly dangerous isotope because uh, iodine goes to your thyroids, uh, and then it can stay there and really give your thyroid a lot of dose and uh, set you up for cancer later in life. So iodine supplements, what they're supposed to do is you... Here they're injecting it. That's not necessary. You can just take like a pill, but I think they're actually giving them the protomolecule right now. But uh, you take uh, non-radioactive iodine and it'll go into your thyroid and saturate it. So it can't absorb any more iodine, which includes the radioactive iodine. Because chemically, these things don't look diff any different to your body, uh, the radioactive versus the non-radioactive ones. So if you're in an area where there could be nuclear fallout, you can take some iodine iodine pills and hopefully uh, prevent some uh, radioactive iodine accumulation in your thyroid. What the hell is this? He needs medical I attention. I can see that, but who the hell are you? Hey, mm. some of you guys are taking fire down at Connector Shaft. If you want to check it out, we'll take care of him. Open the door. This is the one that shut. It stays shut. Oh! 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 Alright, so we're here at the, uh, I believe this is a, what they are calling this a hard shelter. I think it's supposed to be a, a place where people can go to be protected from I don't know, solar flares or any kind of radi radiation pulse that's going to hit uh, Eros, this tiny little asteroid. But uh, I don't know why the shelter itself would have... Okay, so this is the radiation symbol down here, the trefoil. Uh, and that means you're in the presence of ionizing radiation, uh, the bad stuff. So um, I don't know why the shelter would have that symbol on it, uh, unless I'm missing something. <laughs> You know, I think they're putting the radiation symbol there just for our, the viewer's perspective, just to let us know that we're getting near some danger or to prime us for what's coming. Get out. Get out! We just got hit with a mega dose of hard radiation. How bad? We're dead. Let's start breaking it down. They got hit with a, a mega dose of hard radiation. There's no such thing as a, a mega dose. <laughs> I don't think I need to state that, state the obvious here. Uh, hard radiation. Now, that is something I can't say that I'd ever heard of before watching this show. Uh, the first time I watched the show, it didn't even like register with me. I thought he was just using it kind of like as an adjective, but hard radiation is actually a thing. And here, according to the American Meteorological Society, Hard radiation is quantum radiation, that is, particles or photons, of high penetrating power, typically of high frequency and short wavelengths, so you're thinking at least x-rays or gamma rays. Uh, so a 10 centimeter thickness of lead is usually used as the criterion upon which the relative penetrating power of various types of radiation is based. Hard radiation will penetrate such a shield, soft radiation will not. Okay, so that's a, an easy way to quantify it. Um, so your soft radiation in this instance will be 
in terms of ionizing radiation will be alphas and betas. Alpha, that is alpha particles and beta particles. An alpha particle is basically a helium atom. That is, it's two protons and two neutrons, no electrons. And then a beta particle is just an electron, basically. So alphas and betas will not penetrate 10 centimeters of lead, but uh, gamma rays will and x-rays will. X-rays to varying degrees. Gamma rays will more. Uh, gamma rays are more energetic. Yeah, so it's basically a distinguishing between of alphas and betas and weaker photons, that is like visible light, x-rays, infrared, and uh, gamma rays, or uh, high energy photons, x-rays, stuff like that. So there's your hard radiation for you. How long do you figure we got? A couple hours, maybe. Hey, they got the radiation meds on that ship of yours? I hope so. In a couple hours. Start bleeding out of places you don't even want to know about. All right, now let's talk about the uh, the doses they just got. So, all right, so for those of you who have seen my Chernobyl videos, you'll recognize this. This is the Health and Human U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Radiation Emergency Medical Management uh, Time Dose Effects in Acute Radiation Syndrome. So, you got some charts here for some uh, some uh, some doses. Uh, this is in gray. Uh, Gray is a measure of how much energy has been deposited in mass from radiation. Uh, it is not like the sievert or the REM, which is uh, the same as a gray, but considers the effects on certain parts of your body, like skin or liver or brain. Gray is literally just how much energy was deposited uh, in your flesh from radiation. So if we scroll through, if we scroll around through these charts, we got different ranges all the way from zero to 45 gray. Uh, anything in the realm of one gray or more is a lot. That's a very large dose. So we're dealing with large doses here, and uh, that makes sense. You're not if you get a really a rather smaller dose, you're really not going to see too many symptoms. Uh, you have to get into these large ranges of of gray and above before you start seeing symptoms. So if we go down here to zero to zero point seven five gray, the first the lowest chart they have here on this website, uh, you'll get vomiting here within sometime within a, f uh, a dozen or so hours, but on a very small percentage of people, only zero to 5%. If we come up here to 15 to 30 gray, these are very large, very large doses. Uh, Holden just mentioned the bleeding thing and uh, I, they would not be bleeding in the time frames we're talking about here within uh, a few hours. Uh, that just doesn't happen according to these charts. So with a, a, a dose of 15 to 30 gray, which is insane, by the way, uh, bleeding would not start until about day seven here. So it takes a while for the bleeding to happen. But uh, in that meantime, you're going to be getting... Uh, you're not going to be in a pretty state. <laughs> uh, that's not to say that... Uh, I mean, as, as, as you come down here to the death category, this is 100% of people are dying at, at, at this range. And that's corroborated by this chart over here, too. Uh, the radiation dose chart. So anything above 10 sievert on this chart is a fatal dose, death within two weeks. So that's like 100% people. This is showing it as being 10 sievert and above is a fatal dose. So it's also worth noting for sievert and gray, uh, the fact that Siever takes a f account of different organs in your body and the different effects, uh, you can get your dose in Siever can be different than your dose in gray, but that'll generally be for stuff like alpha and beta particles. Here we're talking gammas. Uh, so for gamma rays, Siever and gray are equivalent. So we can directly convert between uh, these two charts. We don't have to worry about weighting factors or anything like that. All right, so yeah, but as you can see here with uh, this kind of dose of 15 to 30 gray, 100% uh, of people will die. And uh, this will start around the middle of day two to uh, the end of two weeks. Uh, so if you make it to one week, uh, that's when you're going to start bleeding. But you'll probably die before then. And then if we go up to 30 to 45 gray, you're dead within two to four days. 
the bleeding would likely not happen for them. Uh, it, it, it's too quick of an onset for something like that. So some of these uh, footnotes on these charts are actually interesting. So here for a dose of 8.3 to 11 gray, uh, it actually says, you know, combat effective three to four days. So this is talking about soldiers even in like a nuclear environment. So you could get this kind of insane lethal dose. This one is still at 100% depth, 100% death as well. It says you, you could still be combat effective for three to four days until stuff like uh, fatigue and weakness, dizziness, disorientation, uh, fluid loss, electrolyte imbalance, and headaches start kicking in. But yeah, if they're going to be within a bad state in a few hours, uh, they got some insane kind of dose. And they were only in that chamber for like three seconds or something like that. So that, that level of dose rate is just uh, incomprehensible to think about. <laughs> Like what was giving off that much radiation, but it's a uh, it's like a ticking clock element for the show. <laughs> Alright, so Miller's starting to get like the the vomiting slash bleeding. Uh, like I said, probably way too early for the bleeding, and uh, probably still too early for the vomiting at this point. But uh, the vomiting, the time of vomiting is actually rather variable. It can vary a lot from person to person. All right, so if we come over to this other part of the Health and Human Services website, uh, we get a time to onset of vomiting. So this is a variable process. All right, so we got post-exposure time on the chart down here and then dose on the left. And then uh, it's just a plot of the time it takes for vomiting to start with. a. And you can see there's a correlation with it. As uh, dose goes down, it takes longer to vomit. Miller was starting to vomit within just like a few minutes here, so that would say that their dose was in the realm of somewhere around here, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 uh, to 30 to 40 gray. So something nuts. <laughs> Very high doses here to start doing the, the vomiting that soon. But yeah, as you can see, there's a lot of variability. So uh, right here we got somewhere in the realm of uh, 0.7 or 0.8 hours. Uh, you got a dose here at 10. 10 and a half, 20, 80 or 90, all about the same time for vomiting to start in those instances. So highly variable, uh, but in a population, it's one of those things where you can, you can predict it very readily, but when it comes to one person, it's almost impossible to predict. Yay, statistics. Coming back to the other charts, this is, it's giving a range for when these things are going to start. So we get a range of vomiting, uh, but with these higher doses is always like uh it's in it's always going to happen to you like 100 percent chance but this is the range that you should expect to see it you're pretty messed up the machine keeps trying to switch to hospice <laughs> all right so hold on the miller made it and now uh miller's got a space armband on <laughs> to get rid of the radiation damage. So this is where we're completely in the realm of science fiction. Uh, there is no known way to repair DNA damage of the likes they would have seen from uh, being in that kind of uh, getting those kinds of crazy, insane doses that they got in the order of 10 gray or higher. Uh, so there's, there's really nothing that can be done at that point in present day uh, your dna has been damaged to such an extent that your cells will literally stop being able to replicate themselves now uh, they did not get radioactive contamination they did not get radioactive stuff on them they didn't get like uranium dust or plutonium dust they were just in an, an immense radiation field they got irradiated so there's no radioactivity to remove from them uh I think it is possible for gamma rays to make things in your body radioactive, but the main driver for something like that is neutron radiation. So like being next to uh, an operating reactor, <laughs> which you shouldn't do, or being next to a, a critical neutron chain reaction in like a criticality accident, which you also should not do. The neutrons can turn atoms in your body radioactive. Uh, through what we, through what we call neutron activation, uh, gamma rays don't generally do that, so they really just got irradiated, and yeah, so this future space armband thing would probably have to. I'm assuming it would be like looking at what their DNA says and then trying. I don't. 
<laughs> it's fine. They don't try to explain it. Uh, I'm willing to just uh, be like, ooh, ah, at the cool uh, future sci-fi tech and just leave it at that. Because um, we're quickly getting out of my field of expertise and going into medicine and something like that. But yeah, so that's all just a long way to, way to say they're f***. <laughs> all right, and that was episodes 9 and 10 of season 1. I thought this was all just in uh, episode 9, but no, it was a... Uh, impromptu two-parter on my part but yeah thank you guys for watching hope you found this informative uh i still have not seen season six so please no spoilers hey if you liked what you saw consider checking out my patreon where you can support me directly i don't run ads uh so any support would be much appreciated if you can't support just keep watching much appreciated so thank you guys for watching and i'll see you next time